Let's take our Bibles, please, and turn to Genesis, Genesis chapter 22, and we're going to be reading verses 1 through 14. Ken won't be speaking on this passage this evening, but it is a background for what he will be saying. Genesis chapter 22 and verse 1 is where we'll be starting. Genesis 22 and verse 1. Now it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. Then he said, take now your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So Abraham, Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son. And uh, he split the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey. The lad and I will go yonder to worship and we will come back to you. So Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac his son and he took the fire in his hand and a knife and the two of them went together. But Isaac uh, spoke to Abraham his father and said, my father. And he said, here I am my son. Then he said, look, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham said, my son, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. So the two of them went together. Then they came to the place of which God had told him, and Abraham built an altar there and placed the wood in order and bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. He sa so he said, here I am. And he said, do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And Abraham lifted his eyes and looked, and there behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by its horns. So Abraham went, took the ram, and offered it up for a burnt offering instead of his son. And Abraham called the name of the place the Lord will provide. As it is said in this day, in the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. Well, that's a wonderful account of substitutionary sacrifice uh, and we see God doing that for us too. Ken will, will lead us through that a little bit later. But the gospel describes how we have been saved. Well, it's time to come to the message and Ken, I want to thank you not only for coming tonight but also arranging uh, things for us when when it looked a little tight there on Mother's Day. We bless you for that background work. We also thank you for the support, the prayers, the love of Emmanuel Baptist Church over decades. Thank you, brother. Good to be with you again. I feel a little more like uh, more and more when I come, a little bit more like family here. And um, I must be getting used to things a little more because this time I turned before the overpass bridge instead of going down to the shopping centre and zigzagging through all the back streets and then last week it was shopping centre and learning to come back out onto the main road. This time I turned before the bridge over the road so I feel like I'm at home now. Let's pray before we look into the word of God. Our Heavenly Father how thankful we are for your word we thank you that the theme of your word is our lovely Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ. We think of the two on the road to Emmaus and the Lord Jesus opened and beginning with Moses and the prophets, he showed how they spoke of his beauty, of the Christ who came into this world, that he would die for our sins, that he'd rise again and he ever lives for his people. And we look forward to that day that when he comes back for us, and we say, even so, come, Lord Jesus, come quickly. Help us as we think upon your word tonight. Help me to share what's on my heart. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 
This evening, I would like to turn your focus away from yourselves, at least during this message time, this study time, and onto the Lord Jesus, the Lamb of God, who has taken away our sins. If I could, I would love that these thoughts about our Lord Jesus Christ would overwhelm you. We get so used to being a Christian and so used to what Christ has done, but if only the truths could once more sink deep into our hearts and once in a while overwhelm us. Such love from him. One of the greatest privileges that we have as believers is that the Lord Jesus himself invites us around the Lord's table, invites us to partake of this supper, invites us to remember with thanksgiving the great sacrifice that took place on Calvary, the time when the Son of God, the Lamb of God, took our sins and shed his blood to redeem us. So for this evening's study, I'm actually going to take us back on a long in time, not long in minutes, but long in years' time in our study, stretching back some 4,000 years into the past, and then take us to receive as well a glimpse of the future around the throne of God as the Lamb of God is worshipped. We begin this journey by going back around 2,000 years ago in the land of Judea, where we learn about a man who is called John the Baptist, or John the Baptizer. And he's calling people to turn to God, to repent of their sins and forsake their sins, and to be genuine in their relationship with God. And when John the Baptist sees Jesus coming towards him, he says, recorded in John chapter 1, verse 29, these powerful words... Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Behold, look, pay attention, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And I want our, the focus of this message tonight to be on this passage and particularly on the words, Behold, the Lamb of God. To understand John's words here, we need to be aware of the promise of the Lamb throughout the Old Testament and the history. Remember, history in the Old Testament is his story, the story of God sending a Redeemer. We could, perhaps, if we wanted to, begin in Genesis chapter 3, verse 21. After Adam and Eve had sinned against God, against their Creator... God covered their shame and their nakedness by an animal skin, by causing the death of an animal, most likely a lamb. Or we could touch on Genesis chapter 4, where Abel offers his worthy sacrifice to God, and that was a sacrifice taken from the flock, a lamb. But we'll touch on just three pictures here of the promised Lamb of God in the Old Testament, beginning with Abraham's Lamb in the reading we had earlier on from Genesis 22. Abraham had walked with faith before God, and God had promised to Abraham that through his very wife Sarah, he would become a father. In fact, he would become a father of many nations. Decade after decade passed, until finally Abraham is 100 years of age, Sarah is 90 years of age, and only then, when it's absolutely impossible with man, that's when God provides a son to Abraham in his old age. But when this son is around, well, teenage years at least, a youthful teenage, God now asks Abraham to do the unthinkable, to take his only son, so dearly loved by him, and to offer him as a burnt offering on Mount Moriah. And yet Abraham obeys. 
He believes that God will keep his promise, even if it meant, according to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 19, that God might have to raise Isaac, Abraham's son, from the dead. And as Abraham and his son climb up Mount Moriah, Isaac, Abraham's son, asks his father, my father, look, here is the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham answers in faith, my son, God will provide for himself the lamb for, for a burnt offering. And so the altar is built. The wood is placed carefully in order. And Isaac willingly accepts being bound as a sacrifice. And then Abraham raises his knife and only at that time the angel of the Lord calls from heaven and says, do not lay your hand upon the lad. Abraham stops. And there behind him, there is a ram that is caught by its horns in the thicket. And he names the place. He takes that animal as a sacrifice. He names the place the Lord will provide. God indeed provided the lamb. Behold the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. All of this was not given simply to, uh, ju and just to test Abraham's faith, but to picture to us that God the Father himself would do the unthinkable. And that is he would get, give up his very own beloved son who would come into this world and who would become the willing sacrifice for our sins. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. It would be Jesus. A second picture of the, in the Old Testament is not only Abraham's lamb, but we come to another lamb here, Israel's lamb. We might call it the Passover lamb. The event takes place in Exodus chapter 12. The people, as most of us will know, were slaves in, in Egypt for hundreds of years. God heard the anguish, the cry of the people of Israel in slavery. And he sent Moses to confront Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, and to demand that he lets God's people go. And because Pharaoh hardens his heart and will not let the people go, therefore God sends upon the land of Egypt ten devastating plagues. Not only to force Pharaoh's hand, but also to show God's greatness over the gods of Egypt. The tenth and final plague, of course, the tenth and final judgment, rather, would be that throughout the land of Egypt, every firstborn son would die except the homes where the blood of a spotless lamb would be sprinkled. We read about this in Exodus chapter 12. The verses will be on the screen before you. And I'll read a few of these verses, beginning in verse 3. Speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, On the tenth of this month, every man shall take for himself a lamb. According to the house of his father, a lamb for a household. Verse 5. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You shall make it from the sheep or from the goat, take it from the sheep or from the goats. Now you shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month. Then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it at twilight. And they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and on the lintel of the houses where they eat it. And then verse 23. For the Lord will pass through this to strike the Egyptians. And when he sees the blood on the lintel and on the two doorposts, the Lord will pass over the door and not allow the destroyer to come into your house to strike you. And as the destroyer would pass through there, he sees the blood on the doorpost of each Jewish home. Behold the Lamb of God. 
A spotless lamb had been slain, picturing that Christ was the spotless lamb slain for us. Slain by the people of Israel. Indeed, that's what took place. The Lord Jesus was slain by the people of Israel. This is known as the Passover lamb, Israel's lamb. In 1 Corinthians 5, 7, the Apostle Paul declared, Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed for us. So behold, the Lamb of God. But we have another reference to the Lamb of God. One more reference to this Lamb. We have Abraham's Lamb. We have Israel's Lamb. But I want us also to see Isaiah's Lamb in Isaiah chapter 53. Isaiah 53. Isaiah is ministering around 700 years before Christ. The prophet speaks about a coming servant of the Lord who would come. And when he comes to chapter 53, Isaiah chapter 53, he speaks in more detail about this one who would come as the servant of Jehovah and says he will be like a lamb, a lamb that would be taken to the slaughter in order to redeem God's people. We know this, most of it, I think, ourselves, but let me read a few of these verses. Isaiah 53, verse 4, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. He, this servant that was sent, this lamb, he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed. And he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before its shearer is silent, so he opened not his mouth. Verse 10. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. When you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hands. He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. By this knowledge, my righteous servant shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities." Sometimes you read a passage and there is very little that you should add to it except to read it and to say, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The Messiah, the servant of Jehovah would come to bear our iniquities, who would willingly go in silence and give himself as an offering for our sins. In silence, he was taken in silence, he willingly went to the cross. Behold the Lamb of God. And so we see in the Old Testament the Lamb who is pictured and promised. In fact, every Old Testament sacrifice pointed to the coming Redeemer, the Lamb of God. And yet the blood of bulls and goats, thousands upon thousands, could never take away sin. And the world had to wait with the promise of a coming lamb. But it isn't until we see in John 1 the presence of the Lamb of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God. In the Gospel of John, we read about Jesus. We read about him as the eternal Son of God, the eternal one who is God himself. He is called in John 1 the Word of God. In the beginning was the Word, the Logos. And the Word was with God, and the Word was in fact God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. 
but he goes on in that first chapter to introduce us not only to Jesus, but about an unusual man that we began our message with, an unusual man whose name was John the Baptizer, John the Baptist. John, according to chapter 1 in John's Gospel, verse 6, he was a man sent on a mission for God. The task assigned to him was to prepare the way of the Lord Jesus Christ. This was his sole mission. I can't help but think, when I think of John the Baptist and his mission, his sole mission to promote Christ, he must increase, I must decrease. What is our mission? Do we ever think about why we're here in the world? God could have sa- the Lord could have saved us and immediately taken us to heaven, but he doesn't. He gives us eternal life and place, keeps us here in order to bring glory to his name, to honor his name, and to present to a lost world the Lord Jesus. But for John the Baptist, large crowds were flocking to hear and to see John. He called them to repentance, but then in chapter 1, verse 29, he sees Jesus approaching him, and in the words that only God himself could have revealed to the heart of John the Baptist, we have the presentation of the Lamb of God As John says in chapter 1, verse 29, that word, the phrase I've been repeating, the sentence I've been repeating, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John didn't say, behold the teacher from God from whom you can learn much. He doesn't say, behold the great example to follow. Rather, he zeroes in on the real need of mankind, and that is he needs a savior. The problem for mankind is the problem of sin. And Jesus came to take away the sin of the world. I want you to think about the significance of the words of John the Baptist here. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world by three words beginning with the letter A. The first is the word assurance. When John says, behold the Lamb of God, that word behold is pointing, it's saying, pay attention to this. Here is something that is so important you need to stop and look at. He had this assurance that Jesus was the Lamb of God, the one God had sent to deal with the sin of the world. He is saying, look to Jesus, believe on Jesus with assurance. He alone is the promised lamb. No other person, no other action, no baptism, no sincerity, nothing else can deal with the sin of the world, only the lamb of God, and that is why God had to send his son. Look to Jesus alone. Assurance, behold, The second A is the word atonement. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away sin. He takes away sin. The word atonement, we could say at one meant to bring people who are have a rift between each other because of sin, distance because of sin. He brings them together at one. We have been reconciled to God because our sins have been dealt with. The blood of bulls and goats could never take away sin. They could only temporarily cover the sins from the eyes of a holy God, but it took the Lamb of God to take away our sins. Atonement. The Apostle Peter put it this way, 1 Peter 1, verses 18 and 19 that we were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver and gold. But what was it with? With the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. Our sins have been dealt with in Jesus. Three A's. Assurance, atonement, and all-sufficient. Because we read he takes away the sin of the world. No more is needed. 
Jesus, the Lamb of God, takes away not just the sin of the Israelites, but all who come to trust in him. No matter how deep the stain of sin, no matter how unworthy somebody feels, no matter our background, no matter our culture, no matter our nationality, no matter how strong or weak your faith might be, the Lamb of God, behold, the Lamb of God takes away the sin of the world. Our sin by simple faith, by putting our trust in the Saviour. Standing before John the Baptist was the promised Lamb of God. But it wasn't enough just that the Lamb of God was presented. There had to be the offering up of the Lamb of God on Calvary. It wasn't sufficient that he came into this world as the Lamb of God, but that he accomplished the purpose for which he came. He was offered up as the Lamb on Calvary. And within three and a half years from the date that John made this statement, on the very day that the Jewish people in Jerusalem were slaughtering their Passover lambs, on the very day in which over 10,000 sheep were slaughtered in the temple with the blood flowing down into the Kidron Valley below. On that very day, Jesus, the Lamb of God, God's Passover Lamb, Abraham's Lamb, Isaiah's Lamb, God's Lamb, he offered himself as a sacrifice for our sins. He allowed himself to be taken, to be falsely tried, to be beaten, to be abused, to be mocked, and finally led to Calvary to be the Lamb of God to take away the sin of the world. Shall we hear how John's Gospel puts this? In John's Gospel, chapter 19, verses 17 and 18. It's interesting that none of the gospel writers expand on the ugliness of crucifixion. They were very much aware of it. But John simply records these words. Jesus, bearing his cross, went out to a place called the place of the skull, which is called in Hebrew Golgotha, where they crucified him. That was it. At noon, three hours of darkness fell upon the land and we hear the voice of the Lord Jesus recorded in Matthew 27, verse 46, as he cries out, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? As the wrath of a holy God falls upon the Lamb of God as he bears our sins. Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And John records the words of Jesus. It is finished. It is completed. The Lamb of God had died for our sins. No more sacrifice would be needed. It was complete in the Lamb of God. And this forgiveness is available to every one of us. I assume most of you here, without any question, I expect that you'd say you've trusted in Christ, but only you know your heart. Only you know what's going on deep within. But I can encourage you, if you're struggling with your faith, if you've got doubts, if maybe you've put on a front to be with people you love and care for, today you can turn to the Lamb of God who will take away your sin as well. You see, this Saviour who died as the Lamb of God, he rose triumphantly, defeating sin and death and hell. But I want to close with one more little section from the book of Revelation. I want to touch on praise to the Lamb. The last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation, needs to be understood in the light of the Lamb of God. 
the lamb who is worthy to reign, the lamb who is worthy of worship. Around 29 times in the book of Revelation, it surprised me, but Jesus is referred to for 29 times as the lamb in the book of Revelation. And these are found primarily in six worship passages. He is seen throughout the book as the all-conquering lamb, as the judging lamb, as the redeeming lamb, as the lamb who receives his bride, as the enthroned lamb whose face one day we'll see. But above everything else, he is seen as the worthy lamb. And I want to close with this passage from Revelation 5, verse 11 and following. Then I looked, and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne, The living creatures and the elders and the number of them was 10,000 times, 10,000 and thousands of thousands saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that is in them I heard saying, blessing and honor and glory and power be to him who sits upon the throne and to the Lamb forever and ever. Then the four living creatures said, Amen. And the 24 elders fell down and worshipped him who lives forever and ever. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Behold the Lamb of God who has taken away your sin. And he invites you to be part of this table. He invites us to be still, to examine our hearts, and to remember the greatness of that grace. Let's take this in a way that honors him as we think upon the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, who takes away our sin. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for these glimpses you've given to us in your word of the promised Lamb of God who would come. And though it's amazing to us, you, the Lord Jesus is the Lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world, But in time he came and the world saw him and the world rejected him over all. But he is the Lamb of God who has taken away our sin. And Father, help us as we take this Lord's Supper to examine our hearts, to confess known sin, to recommit ourselves to you and to take in a worthy manner We ask in Jesus' name, amen.